It may be chilly outside, but the baseball hot stove is heating up this winter. With those around baseball wondering with great anticipation and curiosity as to how this off-season puzzle will come together, finding landing spots for the likes of David Price and Zach Grinke top this off-season's headlines list, and how those moves in particular will change the landscape of baseball, if at all. Tyler Kepner is a national baseball columnist for the New York Times, and he joined me on Monday to help me get a clearer picture of this off-season's forecast. So first of all, Tyler, we want to uh, th thank you for joining us for on the Two Man Advantage podcast, and we're excited to talk uh, some baseball with you this morning. Yeah, happy to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. So, Tyler, when we look at uh, uh, what's going to occur this season, obviously David Price and Zach Greinke are, are going to be at the top of everybody's wish list who's looking for pitching. So could you give me an idea of where you think uh, those two players will go in particular? Well, that's the biggest question, um, Kevin. You know, uh, those two guys uh, have, have you know, the Cy Young winners in the past and, uh, you know, still at the very top of their games. Uh, really, I think, uh, you know, they could have won it this year easily. Both were runners-up. So um, yeah, you're going to have uh, a, a lot of interest. I think when it comes down to it, um, you look at the teams with, that have the money to, to, to afford a, you know, a, a major commitment like that, $25 million a year, almost $30 million a year maybe, um, it's crazy as it is to say. Um, you know, when you see that Max Scherzer gets $30 million a year and, and Clayton Kershaw gets $30 million a year, you figure, um, you know, that, that, uh, that these guys will be in that category too. So you, you look at who has the biggest need and who has the money to spend, and I think that Boston Red Sox certainly have a need for an eighth. Um, they traded some prospects for a, a, closer, a closer in Craig Kimbrell, and uh, they feel like they can get their ace on the free agent market. So I would think the Red Sox, uh, you know, are a good fit for David Price. And I would think that, um, you know, if, if not the Dodgers, maybe the Giants are a good fit for, for Cranky, although I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't count out the Cardinals either. The Cardinals usually don't throw out that kind of money, but um, I think that I know that's the place that would appeal to Cranky. Um, and uh, and the Cardinals uh, every now and then they can uh, they can surprise you. So I don't know that I'd pick them. I think it's safer pick to say that he goes back to L.A. or maybe San Francisco. But I wouldn't I wouldn't totally count them out either. Now, when we look at the two New York teams, obviously uh, they both made the playoffs, but one went further than the other. So how aggressive uh, do you anticipate them being uh, this off season? Well, yeah, the, you know, the Yankees, they, they go through these um, periodic uh, winters where they do get really aggressive. Um, you know, after the 2008 season, they went out and signed Sabathia and Teixeira and A.J. Burnett, um, and they won the World Series. But uh, yeah, after the 2013 season, um, you know, they, they went out and signed a bunch of guys, Tanaka, McCann, and Ellsbury, and, and Beltran, and... Uh, and they haven't. Uh, they still haven't won a playoff game since then. So um, there certainly would seem to be the need for the Yankees to to uh, improve themselves uh, with with a big starter. But um, all indications are that they uh, they they don't want to play on those big those big guys. They really want to get those uh, other contracts off the books, and uh, they feel like they're already spending enough. Probably spending too much, um, in fact. So I think the Yankees, uh, you know, you always have to be aware of them, but I'll take them at their word in that they're going to, uh, you know, not participate in some of the major, major free agent spending um, that we'll see. You know, well, the Mets, um, they also, you know, they say they can raise their payroll a little bit, but they've never shown an inclination to, to spend with the, the biggest spenders. They don't think... Uh, they have to, and I think this past year has kind of validated that for them, that they were able to make the World Series, um, you know, and get three, three wins from a championship without having to do that. So I don't expect the Mets to really be involved either. They might make a play for Cespedes, um, unless the bidding gets out of control to try to keep him. Um, but I think uh, the Mets and Yankees will uh, largely stay on the sidelines of the really uh, crazy 
spending that we're likely to see. And in your opinion, what's the uh, most intriguing off-season headline we'll all be paying attention to this winter? Well, it's it's such a uh, it's such a deep free agent class that I think you'd have to say, um, you know, where those where those free agents go. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm always interested in the moves the Dodgers make. I just feel like you know a team that has so much money, um, you know, but also has a front office that is used to not having money. Um, you know, what what moves will they make? Now, last year, you know, they, they made some some moves that pretty much resulted in the exact same thing. Um, you know, a, a division title on a first round knockout. Um, so I'm always interested to see what they, they do typically, but I think just the bigger picture is just where the all these great are going to go. You know, and how it's going to play out because when you have so much talent out there in the market, um, it's a little unusual now. So many stars, uh, you know, with so much money in the game, so many stars sign long term deals with their teams before free agency. Well, these guys didn't. Um, you know, Jason Hayward and Justin Upton and uh, Cespedes, and, and of course the big pitchers we've talked about, Cranky Price, even Johnny Cueto and Jordan Zimmerman, and, and uh, there was a lot of good names out there. So, um, Interested to see how high the spending goes, even though we, we've we've seen time and again that most uh, nine-figure deals um, don't end up working out for the teams. Um, teams are still really competitive, and they always think that this guy can be the exception. Now, for the Detroit Tigers, they decided to uh, keep manager Brad Ausmus to, despite their uh, struggles at the end of the year. Were you were you surprised at all that they decided to do that and? What, what direction do you think the uh, Tigers will go under new general manager Al Avila? Well, they've already, um, I think, shown that they're going to continue to try to uh, go for it. They're not really uh, tearing down. You know, they, they, they did trade some veterans, obviously, at the deadline um, when they calculated that uh, they, you know, this was a lost season. So they were able to get some youth um, for down the line in the deals for David Price and for Yohannes Sestas, and both of those guys obviously went on and, and uh, were huge for their teams down the stretch. So I think, though, that it's not a full-scale teardown. I think what you're seeing is the Tigers going, going for it again. Um, you know, anytime you have Verlander and, and, and Cespedes, uh, sorry, Verlander and Cabrera signed for a long time, you're going to try to win with those guys. And that's why they went out and they got um, a, a closer in Francisco Cabrera, or Francisco Rodriguez, and uh, they went out and got a uh, center fielder in Cameron Maven. So we're seeing the Tigers, um, you know, continue to go for it. I, I, I guess I was a little surprised that Austin stayed on just because he, uh, you know, he hasn't really, um, you know, strategically, I don't think, certainly in the playoff series, uh, distinguished himself that much. And, and the team certainly underperformed last year. And, and, and he was the choice of Dave Dabrowski. So, you know, Dabrowski's gone now. Um, but Avila was Dabrowski's right-hand man. And, uh, you know, I, sometimes I do think it's okay to, to not have a knee-jerk reaction, you know, one bad season and you're gone. Um, you know, if, if they thought Austin was the answer a couple of years ago, um, one division title and one bad year later, um, is he really not the answer anymore? Um, so I guess in that sense, it's, it's good that he's sticking around. I, you know, I think Brad's a, a very bright guy and handles players really well. And, and uh, you know, he, he's, he's smart enough to, uh, to adapt to the job as it goes on. So, um a little surprised, I guess, just because um, it's such a win now mentality there in Detroit. But um, I think I'm also encouraged that he uh, that he that he still has uh, another chance to uh, to get it right. Now, which new manager are you most intrigued to watch this year, and which, in your opinion, has the most to prove? Well, um, I, I, I think I'm most intrigued to, to see. Uh, how Dusty Baker gets back in the game there with, uh, with the Nationals. I mean, we saw last year, um, you know, Matt Williams uh, really lose control of that team, um, both on the clubhouse and uh, and in the moves that he was making. Um, you know, they went out and got somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, from the old school. And, um, you know, so many of these managers are, are, are young guys who've never had a managing opportunity before, um, maybe came right off the field or close to it. Um, but Dusty's, uh, you know, this is a sports job, and he's, he's taken three other teams to the playoffs, and, and uh, he's well-known with a well-deserved reputation as, as a, a guy players love to play for. Um, so even though Matt Williams had that recent experience as, as an all-star player, um, you know, 
he's experienced a little longer ago. I think he commands respect, and he has a way of communicating with players that's uh, unlike just about anybody else in the game. So I'm really interested to see if he can get that underachieving Washington national team to uh, to get back to the playoffs, um, you know, where everybody expected them to be. Um, so I'll be interested to see how he does that. As far as managers on the uh, on the hot seat, um, you know, I, I think the John Farrell story is very interesting, um, just because the Red Sox, uh, you know, really had their second. Um, rough season in a row, um, and when they rebounded late in the year, uh, you know John was uh, he was out, um, you know battling battling cancer. Uh, from all indications, he was very very involved as, as much as he possibly could be, um, and and he he did win a World Series there in, in 2013. So I think you have to honor that. You have to honor the fight that he that he uh, personally in late last year, um, and uh, and I, I really think it's great that they brought him back. He certainly deserves it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely something to watch just because, um, you know, he won the championship, but, but since then his teams have, have, uh, have not been that great. And, uh, you know, the Red Sox are always in, uh, in it to win it. So he, they've finished last place and they've, they've made some moves. Um, but uh, Dabrowski's there working with him for the first time. So I think that's a situation that's uh, certainly unique and, uh, and one that, 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 that bears watching pretty closely. Now, when we look at uh, who will bring the biggest competition to the Royals, who do you think that would be in the, the Royals' attempt uh, to repeat uh, this year? The biggest challenge for them? Yes. Um, well, I think I, that's a great question. I mean, they're certainly the best team in baseball. I don't think anybody doubts that um, right now. Um, the challenge will probably be you know, replacing some of the guys that they're going to lose, um, as it is for, for all teams. So they'll probably lose uh, just because that's their free agents. You know, Johnny Cueto and, and Ben Zobrist. Um, you know, will, will those guys stay or will they leave? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, when, when, when you get a team that, you know, when you, when you get players, very good players go to free agency, uh, you know, they usually do leave uh, because of the competition. So they'll, they'll need to find a way to, re, to replace them, um, but they've shown that they have a, a, a formula that, that works there and that's really tough in October. Um, I think you, you know you, you think about the competition in the division. The rest of that division really sacked last year. I mean, they finished. They won the division for twelve games. Um, so you know, will the will those young Cleveland pitchers come together and get them off to a, a better start? So they're more of a challenge. You know, will Detroit um, put it back together this year? You know, I think around the around their own division, they, they, they've got some interesting teams um, that could challenge them. You know, Minnesota was very good last year, surprisingly. Um, you know, is that an aberration or, or, or something that they can build off? Um, you know, and the White Sox uh, were very disappointing last year as well. And, you know, can they can they get back in this mix? So um, I think I think it'll be replacing the guys they lost and uh, and the other teams in their division. And also a small portion would be just sustaining that drive. I don't doubt that they will. But, you know, so much of what they did last year um, seemed to come from the, a really strong sense of purpose that they had from losing in Game 7 of the World Series the year before. Now that they've uh, climbed that mountaintop, um, you know, will they be able to have that same sense of uh, drive and determination to, uh, to go back-to-back? Um, they probably will, but um, I think that's still something that you have to, uh, you have to think about. Now, you touched on this earlier with the Washington Nationals in terms of underachieving, but what underachieving team do you think is set up to be most successful from a year ago that underachieved that could uh, find success going into next season? Well, I think Washington is is one you could look at um, for sure. Uh, We touched on them earlier. I think Baker helps them there. And I also think it'll help them to get younger. I mean, they'll have fewer um, recognizable, sort of proven guys there if and when, um, you know, Zimmerman leaves. And, and certainly, you know, no one expects Desmond to be back. Um, Denard Span uh, may leave as well. Um, so they'll have, you know, some holes to fill. But the good thing is that it seems like they have young um, players who have already proven a little bit at the big league level uh, who are ready to step in. You know, I think Trey Turner, his time has come there at shortstop. Um, he, he, he's a very athletic, uh, talented guy who's going to help them at that hole. Um, I think, you know, you have Tyson Ross's brother, um, Joe Ross, who will get a, a full full year there in the rotation. 
I think Tanner Roark can move back to rotation, uh, maybe take place in the fifth year. Um, so I'm eager to see what those guys do with a full year. Um, you know, often baseball nowadays, these young guys come up and they seem to hit the ground running and they're in their prime right away, uh, just about. So, um, you know, you also have Michael Taylor, who uh, can take over in center field for Span. You know, Span missed most of last year anyway with injuries. Um, so if you get these young guys in, they're as talented as they seem, um, you know, sometimes that can, uh, you know, bring a little spark to a clubhouse. So I, I think the Nationals are, are a really prime bounce-back candidate, especially in that division where Philadelphia's down, Atlanta's uh, down right now, and uh, the Marlins had a really bad year with 91 losses. So um, the, the, the Nationals should have another really good opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to, to do something in that division. And also uh, another team I would look for is the Seattle Mariners. Um, everybody expected them. I, I know I did to win the division last year. Mariners had a rough year. They've got a new uh, general manager, a uh, new uh, manager, and they've already made some moves there to try to get better. Um, so I would I would think the Mariners, I'd be disappointed in, for their sake if they don't get back into this race, um, which was a very interesting one last year with Texas, Houston, and Anaheim. So um, interesting to see if uh, Seattle can uh, you know, elbow its way back to where we thought they were at the start of last year. Now, uh, David Ortiz recently announced his retirement. I'm wondering, with you being in the New York market, if you could uh, provide some perspe- uh, perspective on his career uh, in Boston. Well, he's had a, a really, um, you know, remarkable career um, in the sense that he is, uh, you know, he became one of the biggest stars in the game and had memorable um, careers that we've seen um, just in terms of impact um, on the field and off the field in terms of connection with the city that he played in uh, and in terms of uh, championships won. I mean, and let's not forget, uh, the Red Sox have gone 86 years without a championship until uh, Ortiz and the gang won it in uh, 2004. A lot of guys shared in the, in the credit for that. Of course, Manny Ramirez and Baker Martinez, Kurt Schilling and Johnny Damon and Jason Veritek and Derek Lowe, you know, so many Keith folks, so many um, players had a major part in that. Um, but Ortiz was, uh, was front and center. He was certainly Mr. Clutch. And, um, you know, leading them to two more championships in 07 and 13 um, really changed the, uh, the entire character and outlook of, of uh, the fans up there and, and of, uh, of one of baseball's flagship franchises. So um, he made a major impact in a memorable way. He was the last guy an opposing pitcher wanted to see um, at the plate in the clutch situation. Um, you know, tremendous performance in, in the postseason and when the Red Sox needed him most. Did not win an MVP award, but he certainly could have. Um, surpassed 500 home runs at that benchmark. And, uh, you know, he, he, he uh, not always the model for running hard to first base, uh, not always the model for saying the uh, politically correct thing. Um, he could be profane at times. He, uh, he failed a drug test in 2003 before they were testing uh, with penalties, at least. Um, so he's got that complicated uh, part of his legacy. But I think his legacy is very secure and very uh, long-lasting in Boston, um, you know, uh, forever. So we'll, we'll miss having stars like that because I think he, you know, the more players baseball can have who, you know, you need to see their at-bat. You never want to leave what you're doing when this guy comes up, um, the, the, the better the game is. So we need more must-watch guys like uh, David Ortiz. So it'll be a... It'll be a shame to see him go, but, you know, at four years old um, and still going strong, uh, you'd rather see a guy go out that way than, uh, than limp, uh, limp to the finish line like, uh, like many people do. My final question for you, Tyler, has to do with rule changes and the rule of instant replay. How do you think uh, any changes to the rules and the expansion of instant replay will affect uh, the quality of the game? Um. Well, I I like the fact that instant replay can uh, you know can get get all, gets the calls right. Um, I think that's the goal. Um, you don't want things to be decided by a, a bad call, but I do wonder if it can be done any any better. Um, just just because you know when you watch a game now, you notice it more maybe when you're at the field. Um, because instant replay is, is, is kind of, you know, it's geared for TV. So when you're watching it on TV, 
you maybe don't feel it as much as you would at the, at, at, at the ballpark. Um, and what I mean is, at the ball, when you're at the ballpark and you're watching the game and there's a close play, um, it seems almost automatic now that there's going to be sort of an awkward pause and everybody sort of looks in the dugout to see the manager looking down to see if his coach who's communicating with the replay guy thinks he should go out on the field. There's this awkward pause. Either he goes out or he doesn't, but there's still this this kind of unnatural sort of break in the action almost, or it's like the record skips on an old record player um, or a CD player or something. It's like you just get a skip in the action, and it doesn't feel natural anymore. Um, it doesn't, like I said, it's okay on TV because you're watching those replays anyway on TV, um, but it takes away a little bit from the ballpark experience. Now, is it worth it? Um, I guess grudgingly I'd have to say that it is worth it um, because it gets it right. But I do feel like we missed something in the, in the natural flow of the game, um, the fact, you know, in the fact that replay is so accepted now. So if they're going to you know, expand it or make it even more a part of the game, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that I'd vote against it, but I don't know that I'd vote enthusiastically uh, in favor of it either. Tyler, I want to thank you for your time and for joining us uh, this morning on the Two Man Advantage podcast. All right, Kevin, thanks very much. Good luck. Have a great day. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye.